We'll be starting in four minutes. Yes, Sandeep, we'll start in a couple of minutes. Solomon, uh, Daniel and Dr. Yang Li is on the stage. Uh, I can see Christy, Christy Yutas here. Christy, uh, please can you join us on the stage, please? Okay, right. So you want yes, Christy please. to yes. come on stage, right? Okay. She's here. Okay, right. So Dania is on stage. Uh, let me check. Yeah, I'm ready. How about Stanton? Yeah, it's Stanton Hester. Is he here? Right. I believe he's from the same university as Christy. So maybe we can ask Christy if he's coming or not. Okay. Right. Uh, Nassim, it looks like yeah. you can invite. I'm not able to invite her. Uh, okay. How do I invite? Okay. So you will see uh, three ellipses. Yeah. If, by. Besides, but she's a speaker. She she should be able to come on stage directly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but somehow she she seems to be on stage here. Yeah? Let's see. I can't see those uh, the three dots, Solomon. Yes, it's not there that you are correct. Because she is already a speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she should be here. She should be here. It looks like she's she's not in the she's just gone away now or maybe she's coming on stage okay she's here am i on the stage now yes you're on you're on the stage you're on backstage oh. Okay. Yes, you are on the stage. So we have Christy, uh, Yang Li, and Daniel. And uh, Christy, you know, is, is, is Stanton Hester coming? I just called him and I got voicemail. I, I haven't talked to him. It's, um, okay. it's you know, it's 6.50 in the morning here. And I don't, we just switched to daylight savings time. 
So I don't know if he somehow might have gotten messed up. Um, I happen to be a co-author on his paper too, so if I needed to, I could probably present both. You could present both. Okay. Could present. So uh, it's okay. we have Fine. the first is Yang Lu, then Christy, then Spinter, and then Daniel Uribe in the end. So we will we will start the session. Um, Professor Shukla is coming. Yeah, he's there. Okay. Um, good, good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you are, this is uh, session number four of blockchain research presentation. Um, uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Professor Sandeep Shukla to you, who is the professor of cyber security and blockchain at uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur, India. And uh, Sandeep is also our editor for the cryptography and blockchain section at the JBBA. So Sandeep, over to you. If you could tell us a, a bit more about you and what you do at the IIT and what your university and institution does. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, 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 Naseem. Uh, and a uh, very warm welcome to everybody to this session. And uh, good afternoon for people in the UK. Good morning to people in the US and good evening to people in Asia. So, uh, if you mute your microphone, please. Uh, could all speakers mute their microphone, please? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I am Professor Sandeep uh, Shukla, and I am a professor here at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. And uh, I was the former head of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering here. And right now, I have multiple different hats that I, I don uh, One is, uh, of course, uh, I am uh, the uh, uh, one of the program directors for our Cybersecurity Technology Innovation Hub and a joint director of the cyber, uh, Cybersecurity for Critical Infrastructure Center. I also uh, uh, am one of the joint uh, uh, program directors for, for the National Blockchain Project, which is a Government of India funded project for application of blockchain in e-governance. And after three years of uh, running that project, uh, uh, as per the charter of the project, we have opened a non-profit company called Proven Foundation, which is uh, actually carrying out real e-governance implementation for various government entities in India. And right now, uh, our uh, foundation is very busy working on a uh, blockchain-based land registration project whose pilot is supposed to be released uh, in uh, three weeks from now, uh, which is uh, uh, one of our uh, first uh, real-world uh, pilots for land registry blockchain. We also are working very hard in the uh, self-sovereign identity uh, uh, blockchain that we have created. Uh, we have a health blockchain uh, with proxy re-encryption for privacy preserving data sharing uh, that is going to be piloted inside the hospital at this institute uh, and then hopefully in uh, some larger hospitals and so on. So we also do a lot of work on the uh, on looking at the inequality in the uh, cryptocurrency ecosystems like in Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. We have done quite a bit of work on detecting malicious nodes in cryptocurrency blockchains in Bitcoin and Ethereum in particular. Uh, so there is a lot of things that are going on uh, in our uh, uh, under the uh, umbrella of this national blockchain project. So, so that's uh, kind of uh, I guess enough about me for now. Uh, so at this point, uh, we can go ahead with the abstracts presentations and uh, everybody has uh, basically 10 minutes, nine minutes to present and one minute for answering any uh, questions. Uh, and the order is uh, Dr. Yang Li, who is an assistant professor at the Nankai University in China. And then second uh, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Christy Yuthus. Uh, who is a professor at the Portland State University. And then uh, the third one is Professor uh, uh, Dr. Stanton Heister, 
who is an executive director at the Portland State University. And the final speaker is uh, Dr. Daniel Uribe, who is the CEO of Genobank. So I would request Dr. Lee to actually do his presentation and keep the time so that uh, we can finish on time. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all virtually. I'd like, first of all, to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me here today. And I want to say a special thank to Professor David Lee for giving me this opportunity to present our work. And my name is Yang Li, and I am an assistant professor from Nanka University. And in this talk, I would like to concentrate on the mechanism that is able to promote trust among strangers in the marketplace. Today's topic is uh, of particular interest to those of you who have ever had online shopping experience. So as we all know, there are great uncertainties and risk in the online platform. And the, the proponent of blockchain claimed that this technology combined with the smart contract enabled decentralized marketplace by eliminating the counterparty risk without the, the, without the reliance on the intermediary. However, uh, the technique might be limited to the digital transaction in which zero knowledge proof could be reached. It might harm some issues for physical transaction where zero knowledge proof is hard to apply. Actually, in our early work, we found that 33% of the subjects played the trick to others during the trading game through the blockchain-based marketplace. And the intuition behind this result is intuitive. Blockchain themselves cannot confirm whether the item has been delivered is fake or not. Imagine the blockchain as regarded as a perfect piece of bread, fresh and tasty, and we rarely, however, eat bread by itself. We eat sandwich, as we add butter, cheese, pickles, oh, by the way, I love pickles. If any of this additional ingredient is white, the whole sandwich becomes inedible. So the point is simple. Blockchain cannot by themselves support marketplace. For blockchain to serve as a technology underlying decentralized marketplace, their functionality must be extended. So in, in order to mitigate fraud issues by using the decentralization property, we propose a mechanism in which there is a trust government agency emerge to resolve the, dispute, the disputation when the buyers initiate an arbitration due to for uncertainty of the quality of the purchase. In addition, the authority is able to disclose the fraud action to the public and provide subsidy to cover partial of the buyer's arbitration fee. So in this paper, uh, we first attempt to answer the question of does our proposed mechanism decrease the fraud rate? The answer should be yes, and the intuition is simple. If buyers know that the seller's fraud record and the arbitration fee will be subsidized, even though they made a mistake, then the incentives of the, of the arbitrating will be higher. This fact may make the seller choose to deliver the authentic good exempted since he anticipates that the buyer would be more likely to judge the quality of the good. It seems like the arbitration fee is also an important role in increasing the incentive of buyers to judge the quality of the good. Apparently, the optimal strategy of the buyer is to arbitrate if there is no fee. And in the obvious case, I mean, the arbitration fee is very high, and then the best response of the buyer is to choose not to judge. So we also want to test if a less expensive arbitration fee yields a lower fraud rate. So without loss of generality, let's first look at this two-stage repeated trading game with asymmetric information. And the game starts at stage one, and the seller mm -hmm. moves first and chooses to deliver the authentic item or not. Note that the quality of the good is the seller's private information, but the buyer can judge it after receiving it. And then the game continue, continues to stage two. Since there is no information disclosure, there is no difference between these two stages, and thus the payoff matrix is the same for every sub-game. That is given as follows. We can see uh, we, I used the, uh, the green color to highlight the payoff contract. Uh, if the buyer chooses to, ar uh, to arbitrate the authentic good, and she has to pay the arbitration fee, in this case, the 
buyers pay off is equal to the value of the authentic good VT minus the price P and minus the arbitration fee A as well. And the seller's payoff is equal to the price minus the cost of the authentic good CT. If the buyer choose not to arbitrate the authentic good, and then the buyer's payoff is equal to the VT minus price, and the seller's payoff is equal to the price minus the cost of the authentic item. On the other hand, if the buyer chooses to arbitrate the fake one, and then she will get the money back and keep the fake item, but the seller is charged the, uh, the arbitration fee. So in this case, the, buyer, uh, the, the buyer's payoff is equal to the value of the fake item, VF, while the payoff of the seller is equal to minus CF minus A, the arbitration fee. However, if the buyer choose not to arbitrate the fake item, then the buyer's payoff is equal to the value of the fake item, VF, minus the price P, and the seller's payoff is equal to the price minus the cost of the fake item CF. And it is easy to show that the fraud rate in this two-stage repeated game in equilibrium is given by A divided by A plus the price P. Now, if we uh, look at the proposed mechanism, first note that the game tree under our proposed arbitration mechanism contrast with the previous trade. I use the, uh, the red circle uh, to highlight this node. The payoff matrix is different after the first stage strategy profile, fake and arbitrate. Since the buyer will receive subsidy if she chooses to judge the authentic item, so we can see that uh, the sub game after this node uh, with an uh, extra term I highlight use the red color. This is the S multiply N. Actually, this is the subsidy received from the authentic. And after uh, the sum algebra, the fraud rate is given by this term with the positive extra term X in the denominator compared to the uh, fraud rate of the benchmark case. So it is straightforward to show that our proposed mechanism yields a lower fraud rate compared to that of the benchmark case, and that the fraud rate is an increasing function of the arbitration fee under both regimes. Therefore, we now have two predictions of our model that we are going to test. First, the fraud rate of sellers decreases in the marketplace where our proposed mechanism appears. And the second one is the downsized argument fee decreases the fraud rate for both regimes. Well, it is difficult to test these theoretical predictions against the online market in the field since there is no such a proposed mechanism implemented in the reality. Fortunately, this problem can be overcome by moving to the laboratory where it is possible to test our research hypothesis. The experiment was conducted using the Z-Tree software in the Nankai Experimental Finance Laboratory, and a total of 100 subjects were recruited from the graduate student population of Nankai University. Each session consisted of 20 subjects with no prior knowledge of the experiment. And in each round, there are 10 sellers and 10 buyers, and only one identical item will be sold in each matched transaction. And we give some numbers to the uh, verifier and the, the cost and the price. And we can see that the authentic item yields 20 utility for buyers, while the fake one yields only five. And the cost of authentic, authentic item is said to be 10, while the cost of the fake one is said to be only five. And the price level is fixed at 15. And we start with the experiment with arbitration fee at 4.5. And we will decrease the fee in the later experiments. Yang it should be one minute. Okay, it should be emphasized that in the experiment with our proposed mechanism, the subsidy is equal to uh, point zero, uh, zero 0.1 multiple by n, where n is the frauded detected time of the car bonding seller, and we run the time. know the information disclosure. And we can see that the fraud rate is decreased from uh, 0, uh, 0 0.26 to, 0, uh, to 006. 
uh, as the arbitration fee decreased from 2.5 to 0 0.0. And the panel B shows the proposed mechanism with the information disclosure and the subsidy to the arbitration fee. And we can see that the fraud rate decreased from 0 0.15 to 0. So uh, compare these two panels, we can see that there is a remarkable decrease in our proposed mechanism. And we can use this, uh, uh, this figure to show this part more clear. And we can see that uh, the red color is our uh, proposed mechanism yield the fraud rate is uh, much lower than the fraud rate compared to the benchmark case. And we can see that when the arbitration fee is low enough, the fraud rate is zero. So before I stop, let me go over the key issues again. This study provides a mechanism for promoting trust in the blockchain-based marketplace pl uh, platform in which the blockchain protects transaction data and the personal information. And there's an authority who is able to resolve the disputation and disclose the fraud detected to the public. In addition, the authority is capable of subsidizing the arbitration fee. So based on the theoretical result and laboratory evidence, we can see that our proposed mechanism decreases the fraud rate significantly, and there is no fraud if the arbitration fee is low enough. We hope our work can help application of consortium blockchain platform in which there's an authority entitled with the right to access users' identity and provide the tokens to buyers so as to increase their incentive of, of arbitrating. So uh, thank you, thank you so much for your attention and interest. And, and I'm interested in discussing with you after the presentation if you have some idea or the suggestion about the design of the information disclosure mechanism. Thank you, thank, thank you, you so doctor. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, so uh, I have one question, quick question. Uh, it seems like uh, the application of this repeated game with uh, sub-game equilibriums and so on uh, is irrespective of blockchain, except that uh, you know in blockchains uh, arbitration mechanism could be uh, uh, you know already well defined. Uh, uh, so. Uh, this can be applied to any e-commerce uh, kind of uh, setup, right? Actually, this is a conceptual uh, mechanism, and we uh, actually this is just a, a preliminary work. Uh, we want to mm -hmm. add some uh, more item, like uh, actually is more related, such as maybe we can borrow the idea from the the Wi-Fi seller proposed in the Amazon, mm -hmm. or maybe we can use the method uh, popular in the in the eBay, like the top re related uh, the, the the sellers plus mechanism and maybe we can use the, the, the token economics like we just gave the tokens to uh, promote the trust among the sellers and, and buyers not use the arbitration fee and okay. and, and yeah and, and, we, and then we will do our best uh, to uh, polish the paper All right. and thank you thank you thank you for your suggestion thank you very much so next uh, i request uh, dr christy Uthas from uh, portland state university to do her presentation uh, 10 minutes is the time, nine minutes plus one. Okay, thank you. Um, give me one second. Are you able to see that screen? Uh, no, I see Are you able to see that? Let me try again. How's that? Are you seeing it now? On stage. Yeah, now we see. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Christy Yudis at Portland State in Oregon in the U.S. And these are my colleagues, Asad Aziz and Yolanda Saracen. Um, our paper is Strategic Value Creation Through Enterprise Blockchain. And in case I run out of time at the end, so the bottom line is that blockchain can do a lot more than solve existing operational problems. Um, it can open up new strategic opportunities. And our paper provides a framework for thinking through how those opportunities might come to play. So we typically look at, let's see, we typically look at the 
I've got a lag here. I don't know if you can see my, are you seeing the next slide? Yeah, great. Um, yeah. Great, the blockchain value proposition is that enterprise blockchain can address pain points and reduce friction. So big things like address counterfeiting or small things like reconciling um, accounts receivable records with customers. And when it solves those problems, it can improve efficiency and reduce costs and risks. But the question is, is it really worth the investment? So blockchain participation in a consortium and an enterprise blockchain consortium is incredibly costly. So a participant needs to invest in new technology and in tech integration, in personnel and education, in legal and compliance activities, and in governance and management, of course, of the blockchain on an ongoing basis. And so this is, these costs can be overwhelming and that's why many organizations decide that it's just not worth it to make those cost savings. So, but our argument is that we're getting the return on investment calculations wrong. Because right now ROI is just including operational impacts, but it typically overlooks the strategic impacts. So my co-authors and I look to the research literature on strategic alliances and the resource-based view of the firm to help think through the strategic impacts that blockchain could potentially provide. So strategic alliances um, are consortia of firms that come together for a strategic objectives such as uh, research and development goals or development of standards that will benefit these individual participants. Um, and then the resource-based view of the firm essentially argues that a firm's advantage over its competitors is a result of the resources or capabilities that it possesses that other firms do not possess and can't copy. So through the lens of those two theories, our research question was, you know, when can blockchain be a source of competitive advantage? And so we came up with three, three potential sources. So blockchains can help companies build upon their existing strategy, share complementary resources, or build blockchain specific capabilities. So let me just give you some examples. So in this first one, building on existing strategy. So for some companies, the strategy is actually built upon claims made about the provenance of goods. For example, fair trade coffee or organic produce and things like that. The value proposition itself can be bolstered by claims that can be verified through participation in the blockchain. For some companies, um, the blockchain can enable better access to networks and markets. And this is particularly true for small and medium sized enterprises, perhaps in developing countries. So once they get validated and participate on this blockchain, then they may have much better access to potential customers and suppliers that are already part of that blockchain. And then second, um, companies can build advantage through their ability to share complementary resources. So they can leverage the resources of other partners. So for example, if one partner um, has relationships with customs authorities in Egypt or somewhere where the other partner wants to be able to um, do business, then they may be able to leverage those resources and share that potentiality. Um, in addition, there may be much greater access for some of the participants to data that can be used strategically. So for example, the Port of Rotterdam is engaged in uh, blockchain pilots where they gain a lot more information about what's happening with the ships that are arriving. So have they cleared customs? What's their, uh, what are the weights and all the containers, all the details about what's happening. And so they can use that data to make much better um, use of their slips and, um, and really improve the throughput in the ports. Uh, companies can also share risks. So for example, if one of the participants is really good at the know your customer process, the KYC, then that participant can take advantage of 
doing that for the network and then the other participants can reduce their risk by engaging in the customers that have been KYC by that other partner. And then finally, they can build relationships. So when participants, and then they can go on to other forms of alliances, which could be new blockchains or could be R&D alliances and all kinds of other benefits. And then finally, of course, um, participation in the blockchain in one blockchain will help these firms develop blockchain specific capabilities that they might be able to use to their strategic advantage later. So, so um, of course, they get better at consortium governance, uh, understanding just the technology of blockchain and how to build good smart contracts. So a company Henkels, for example, a consumer goods company. So they've been able to create blockchain and uh, pilots for uh, just their consumer goods supply chain business. But with that knowledge, then they've been able to branch out and join other blockchains. So for example, they've joined with Plastic Bank who does recycling and sustainability, which is a competitive advantage for them because they're good at this sort of thing. And they've also joined another blockchain that's a, a tax chain, it's for international tariffs. And then finally, um, participation in blockchain can help companies create new business models. So for example, with, uh, I'm thinking of so many different examples here. Uh, so one, one company is able to tailor insurance projects. So for example, this is marine insurance. So with a lot of uh, better information about uh, weather and what's happening with the different ships that are out in certain parts of the ocean, they can create smart contract based insurance products that can uh, adjust the insurance based on the risks that the boat is taking at the particular time, the route it's taking and how it's avoiding weather and that kind of thing. Um, a blockchain company called Grain Chain helps, uh, helps grain silos do business with small farmers in a way that, and small trucking firms that it never was able to before. So maybe 60 trucks a day are coming in. It's very hard to keep track of all that. So they were dealing only with bigger clients, but now through smart contracting and blockchain arrangements, they're able to deal with small farmers and small trucking companies so that they know who's coming and when. As soon as the truck pulls in, they're able to assess the quality of the grain and figure out the payment for that grain. And then the payment can be released immediately to the truckers and to the farms. Uh, the growers and so that enables them to do business with these farmers who otherwise wouldn't be able to it's, it's a huge advantage for them to get paid quickly so the um to wrap up blockchain isn't just a source of solving existing operational problems it can be a source of competitive advantage and it would be worthwhile for firms to start thinking along those lines as they're doing the ROI analysis of whether it's worthwhile to join a blockchain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yuthis. Uh, I just have a one quick question. So some of the, uh, you had the three categories of advantages that you mentioned. And uh, uh -huh. first two seems to be that uh, it's a byproduct of uh, building alliances uh, rather than anything to do with blockchain. The third category seems to be more specific to having blockchain based consortium but first two do you think that uh, has a very specific uh, blockchain based uh, uh, you know uh, advanced value adds or is it like no. any, any kind of alliance uh, would have that no that's a really good question because alliances can do that alliances can mm -hmm. provide benefits but for example there's a blockchain um, pilot going on in Madrid, where you can purchase one ticket that will take you on the train and then the metro and perhaps on a scooter. So for that scooter company, for example, by participating, they have access to clients that they would have never had before. 
there was no way for them to reach these trained clients. So many people had never rented a scooter, but now that it's an option through their blockchain consortium, they may choose the scooter. And so it just increases the market that's available to them. So yeah, not always, but in certain circumstances, yes, each one of these can apply to specific firms in specific circumstances. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, is Dr. Stanton uh, he's still there or are you going to make his presentation? I have not um, seen, is he last or is there another presenter? Is Daniel Uribe also presenting? Yeah, yes. Daniel. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah, Daniel. Okay, go with him first, and then I'll I'll get this. Okay. So so we'll we'll go with Daniel first. Uh, Dr. Daniel Uri from uh, with the CEO of Gino Bank, and then uh, in the meantime, if Canton arrives or otherwise, Christy Uthis will actually do the presentation. Uh, so you can start, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, good evening or good good morning, depending on the part of the world you're you're at. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. Uh, I must uh, be very grateful with Professor Sandeep um, for the honor of being named doctor. But um, I'm some someday maybe I'll I'll be one. But uh, today I'm I'm just. Uh, an MBA, <laughs> but but thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everybody at the Br British Blockchain Association, um, uh, especially Dr. Nassim, um, that uh, uh, allows me to be here, uh, uh, and and some other friends that uh, are here as well, that have supported my our, our participation here. Uh, like uh, Dr. Sean Mannion and Dr. Lee, David Lee, as well, just to mention uh, a few of them. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will just uh, share my screen. <clears throat> Where is it? Um... Hopefully, okay, here it is. Can everybody see my screen? Not yet, so mm -hmm. yeah, now we start seeing it. Okay. So you have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you very much, appreciate So. Again, thank you very much. Our presentation is called Biosample Tokens, Identity Tokens, and Permission Tokens. And we uh, are just calling it uh, the symphony of private and secure healthcare kind of, of ecosystem, right? So I wanna thank uh, also William Entriken. He's my co-author and he's the lead author of the uh, standard ERC721 in the Ethereum blockchain. So, to is, is this um, research is the continuity or the next or the second stage of our previous uh, research, uh, which I am I'm, I'm grateful with uh, Gisela Waters uh, that uh, allow us to to make this presentation last year. Actually, it was just before the pandemic. Um, I was I was. Uh, presenting this in in Edinburgh. Uh, so very, now, now one year after. So our paper previously was called Privacy Laws, Genomic Data and Non-Fungible Tokens. This paper was supposed to introduce just to the merely concept that our genetic information is, is non-fungible. Um, although we have to say, I mean, this is just to remember a little bit about our past uh, presentation that our human genomic information um, is 99.9% uh, similar. Nevertheless, we have 0.01% uh, uh, of our DNA is unique, or in this case, uh, non-fungible, right? So like, for instance, this is uh, 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 like, uh, 
a graph where we can see the uh, the pedigree of a family that is just inheriting high cholesterol uh, problems, right? Uh, this is it has has to be my my case. So that's why the precision medicine era is based on these unique variants, and that's why we believe uh, from the side of blockchain that we could uh, help people to uh, tokenize their data using these standards and participate in decentralized uh, clinical trials. So this um, e research is uh, based on, on the ERC721 ERC standard. And the most famous application of this NFT is it, ha it happens to be a game right uh, still current the crypto kitties um, hopefully you you have uh, heard about them and especially because these each of these uh, tokens or crypto kitties has its unique uh, uh, digital dna or, or genome and they have their attributes right the phenotype so they have uh, so we we inspire in that in the human side we are uh, just utilizing a standard for DNA fingerprinting uh, based on the on the previous uh, research of this uh, company called Floydime here in the in the Bay Area in San Francisco Bay Area, and they have a 96 SNP uh, array that is uh, used to identify biosamples inside a laboratory. So this was 2020. So we introduce the SNP token, the concept of the SNP token. We also introduce the concept of an ERC721 token called the biosample permission token, which is literally uh, issued by the donor of the biosample in order to uh, publish their permissions on a public blockchain. And this is still 2020. We introduce also the concept of the self-sovereign family DNA wallet. So what's uh, new? What's uh, going on in 2021 and what is about our current research? So these uh, bio NFTs, as we call them, uh, are now in use. Uh, they're still based on the Ethereum standard ERC721. And we have three, three of them. So the first one is the biosample uh, uh, token, uh, which recognizes or is, is a is a unique uh, SNP token for specific variants over uh, over someone or or a donor a specific uh, data set. So we we <clears throat> we recognize these tokens as as unique. The other one would be the biosample permission token, which uh, corresponds to the physical uh, bio or the physical uh, DNA collection tube. And finally, we have an identity token that is to uh, for credentialing purposes. In this case, we have a laboratory director decentralized ID. So, what? How are we using these tokens? This is part of our in uh, our research. So, the SNP token right now, and with collaboration of Professor Bill Buchanan from the Napier uh, University. Uh, he's he's been advising us and um, thank you thank you uh, about this so this um, token we are still uh, developing to reclaim DNA data using uh, for instance uh, a GDPR privacy laws maybe that art article uh, 15 where we can ask companies if they have uh, the genetic uh, information from uh, a specific donor in this case Alice so this is a bloom filter based on tokenized SNP data. SNP data. So this is a privacy preserving mechanism uh, in order to query a database that is uh, previously uh, known. Well, is is previously anonymized or or it's been removed from first and last name, for instance. But we the the this company still has some SNPs that corresponds to Alice and. We are trying to extend the rights of Alice to know it.
the QR code uh, corresponds to the serial number of the saliva tube. And then uh, after they scan, they, they go through a process where they can create a wallet. Uh, this is a cryptographic wallet with 12 words. And then they become obviously the uh, owners and controllers of this wallet and this biosample. And this wallet uh, also creates a secure data room. So laboratory, when the biosample is processed, they can just uh, put the uh, or upload the information on a private uh, encrypted uh, data room exclusively for this donor. And lastly, uh, this is the identity token use case. So we, we give uh, lab directors a cryptographic uh, identity in our platform uh, in the blockchain so they can issue uh, proof of negative COVID-19 test certificates. So if somebody can or would like to scan this QR code, you can see uh, a demo of the COVID-19 test certificates for uh, the purposes of traveling or just uh, uh, yeah, proving that someone has a, a negative test in the COVID-19. The, the, the heart of this uh, project is giving again um, a decentralized identity to the light director, uh, lab director, and this uh, allows them to sign, cryptographically sign these certificates. And this is how they are immutable and they are uh, anti-fraud, anti-fraud. So um, our conclusions in 2021 is uh, obviously the high Ethereum gas fees. <laughs> it's been a trouble. It's been some uh, challenges. Hopefully, uh, Ethereum 2.0 will, will uh, solve this. We also uh, have seen that cryptographic wallet adoption is still uh, a problem or a challenge. And obviously, more research is needed uh, through the question, are NFTs the best approach for managing properly managing healthcare data um, hopefully next year we will be able to present uh, the continue the next part of our research and present to you a complete decentralized solution for exchange of genomic data in a privacy preserving way thank you very much thank you daniel so uh, one uh, quick question uh, do you need 100% uh, gene sequencing for getting the uniqueness uh, in the uh, in the data or 100% uh, uh, DNA sequencing or, or partial DNA sequencing will do? No, no, actually it's a, it's a tiny but very significant um, sample. Um, the, the whole genome is approximately 3.3 billion uh, mm. letters. So we only need 96 of them to tokenize uh, each data because with only 50 matches you mm. you can re-identify a person so this is like a, a, a tiny sample but is uh, big enough or good enough to re-identify the data of someone so this is how sensitive this information is right but if this data gets uh, compromised then there is a problem right so with the identity well in this case, um, the, the Bloom filter solved this because everything mm -hmm. is, is encrypted when mm -hmm. operating. And uh, the, the idea is to do it through uh, uh, the, the mechanisms of zero knowledge proofs and Bloom mm -hmm. filters. So, so at the end of the day, the, the, the SNPs, actually the SNPs are hashed. So the, the, the true data of, of each, uh, of the participants is obfuscated, so it's protected. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Daniel. So is uh, Doctor Stanton uh, is Doctor Stanton back or uh, uh, here? And no, he's he's not. But fortunately, I have his slides because I'm happen to be on that paper too, <laughs> so I can present. So that we are lucky about that. So uh, <laughs> uh, I would request you to go ahead and present on his behalf. Okay. Is that coming up? Uh, not yet. Uh, 
Yeah, it's still not, we can only see you, but not uh, your slides. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, it's, it's looking different to me than it was before. I'm not sure. Um, there might be a delay here. Another way. Uh, yeah, um, but I'm seeing both you and I on the stage and I wasn't seeing that the last time. I don't know if that, there's something different on your end. Um, but I can, I can just start and keep, I'll keep working on it as I, as I go, yeah, I've tried different options. I can't, without going out and back in, I'm not, I'm not sure how else to, uh, I know that I, I know that he has sent, we sent, oh, wait, it's coming up. Okay. It's working it? now. Can you see yeah. it now? Yeah. Okay, great. So this is Stan Heister, me and my colleague, um, Matthew Kaufman, also from Portland State. So, oh, let me just go back. So this is about uh, also about the business side. Uh, it's about consortium capabilities for enterprise blockchain success. So for businesses, blockchain hasn't fulfilled its promises, and the question is, why not? So um, blockchain technology can solve problems that, in ways that haven't been possible before. Um, there are large-scale large blockchain implementations um, that are reporting cost savings, risk reduction, improved stakeholder relationships. But despite the potential, it has not been widely adopted in businesses and most projects have never moved beyond proof of concept or perhaps pilot stages. Um, but we know that a tremendous amount of value can be unleashed for businesses. And so the goal then is to try to identify and remove roadblocks. The delay is on my computer and um, and so, and technology isn't the real roadblock. So as we've just seen, so um, Sandeep and Nassim, you've got brilliant research. We just saw Daniel Ribe and Yang Ling. You know, there's so many brilliant technological minds working on these problems and the technology is advancing so quickly, um, but the business side is lagging so far behind and it's really a problem with getting actual implementations out in the world. So early on, blockchain technology was difficult to understand and use. Um, proof of concepts exposed issues like scalability, interoperability, throughput speeds. Huge strides are being made in those areas. Um, so technological innovation, of course, is advancing rapidly. Problems are being solved. There are other roadblocks, too, that are related. So staffing and skills, you know, it's very hard to find good tech people still in blockchain. Um, there's a lot of regulatory holdups. Uh, I heard that discussed earlier this morning. I mean, it's, it's a really complicated challenge and we need standards. All of those things, however, there's a lot of work being done in all of those areas. And yet on the business side, we're, we're business professors and we teach, we've got seven different blockchain courses at our school. You know, and that's very unique. There's just not very much being done on the business side for some reason in blockchain. Um, but enterprise blockchain is a business problem. So blockchain has so far been treated as a technology problem, which is similar to um, these other technologies, data warehousing, ERPs, and newer things, AI, IoT. So a lot of business people think about blockchains as like an enterprise resource planning system where you integrate accounting and sales and production all into one enterprise-wide system, and they just think of blockchain as that sort of system, except in, instead of connecting functional areas within one business, you're connecting a bunch of businesses together. So it's just back office stuff. It's just sort of accounting. There's not much to it. Um, and so for managers, though, this problem is this idea that blockchain is a team sport. Um, it requires new processes, new business models, revenue streams, and we don't really have 
good ways of conceptualizing that because we're so focused in business on competition. Um, because blockchain is a business problem, teams must involve those who understand how they can create and capture value and know how to drive operational change. So on the business side, what may be needed is the ability to participate in consortia. Sorry, I can't tell if my, oh, there we go. This is the last slide too. So um, here is a framework for the kinds of consortium capabilities that can lead to successful blockchain implementations for enterprises. So these are private, of course, private permissioned enterprise-wide blockchains. So the conditions for success include the fact that there must be a relevant use case um, that involves cross enterprise workflows and the need for real time information sharing, in addition to these normal you know, trust issues that are so widely discussed. The consortium together needs a shared vision for the ecosystem itself, not just the individual partners. They can go off in different directions and they have different things to gain, but for the ecosystem, there needs to be a common shared mission um, and there needs to be a value proposition for that ecosystem and for the individual partners in the ecosystem. And they must adopt a collaborative mindset, which is, is common in some kinds of strategic alliances, as you might've just heard me say earlier. It's common to collaborate in some small areas for some small um, periods of time, but it is not common for businesses to collaborate on bigger long-term projects like this that, that involve sort of process sharing and data sharing. In addition to all those um, conditions sort of at the network level, the individual partners have to have competencies. So they've got to have competence, com competence in the domain area where the use case exists, technical competence. They've got to have the capability to form relationships with other companies. They have to be able to do effective economic analysis so they can see where the value lies in their potential partnerships. And then they've got to understand when they join the partnership, how are they going to capture the value that the blockchain can provide to them? So those are all the necessary conditions before we even get the consortium together. Then the capabilities of the consortium itself are many uh, that are required for success. So situational assessment, they've got to be able to understand potential existing partners, potential partnership partners that may join the blockchain, what's going on with workflows now, how are our workflows evolving, and how is that going to affect the evolution of the blockchain? Um, who are the stakeholders that are being impacted now and in the future? And then, of course, there's a lot of work on governance at different levels, platform levels, tech levels, um, but also at the business process level. Um, and who's involved, which kind of stakeholders may be involved in the governance um, and the different components there that we're needing that we need to, you know, in some cases we can replace out, say consensus mechanisms, we can address interoperability by combining with other networks. There are many different components that we're gonna to have to keep on top of. And so someone in that consortium or many companies within the consortium are gonna to need to have those areas of capability. And then of course, technology, we need to keep on top of the existing demands. And then always with an eye, just as a, just as an IT department in a company would do, just always with an eye to the technological developments on the horizon and how those might affect what we're doing within the consortium. And then finally, we need strategic capabilities. We need to be able to do visioning and foresee what's going to happen in the future and how that might affect this particular group of firms and this use case, sensing opportunities and risks to the consortium as a whole and to the individual firms. Um, and then the ability when there are opportunities to reconfigure the consortium and then to evaluate the progress all along the way. So all of the sort of strategic capabilities that we would need in an individual business to keep it competitive, we need those same kind of capabilities at the network or consortium level. So if all of that stuff is in place, then we can expect certain outcomes. So these ones that are shaded lighter, those are at the individual firm level and the darker blue are at the consortium level or ecosystem level. So 
we can improve partner operations, so process improvements, better business integration across the consortium partners, better security, of course, and all the other benefits that blockchain provides. And then in addition to that, as I discussed in the earlier paper, there may be strategic benefits for these partners, economic benefits, um, and also for their, uh, for their stakeholders, there may be social and environmental benefits. So I mentioned Plastic Bank, for example, the um, sustainability issues. So there may be outcomes far beyond just the, the focal firms that are in the consortium. And then finally, at the ecosystem level, there may be um, direct economic benefits for that ecosystem as it's operating, selling data, for example, that are collected within the consortium and systemic benefits that make the entire, uh, so with say trade lens and the, uh, the marine shipping, you know, make that entire industry improved as a result of the blockchain. So um, to wrap up, we, technology is moving ahead, businesses are falling behind, and they just need to start jumping in and developing the blockchain skills to move enterprise blockchain forward. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, it resonates with me very well that uh, blockchain technology problem is uh, more or less uh, you know, uh, doable, but main problem we are facing is the at the business level. For example, when we are going to do, uh, when we are doing this land record, uh, the land registry management uh, um, blockchain, we have to bring on board the Department of Revenue, the Department of Registry and Stamps, uh, the uh, Unique Identification Authority of India, and uh, all these different stakeholders, and, and many of them are never, uh, familiar with uh, this concept of blockchain. They are suspicious what, how that will change their entire processes and business, um, you know, uh, you know, logic. Uh, so we are getting very, uh, and then there will be actual operators who will be actually using it. So usability and, uh, you know, familiarity and, and all that stuff is, and this is actually uh, setting back a lot of projects. Uh, so I think that we need solutions to this kind of problems. how to handle uh, these different uh, partners or stakeholders and uh, bring them on board uh, in a quickest possible way so that they are convinced and they are actually uh, cooperating. So it's a, it's a actually a very difficult problem. Technology we can solve, but we don't know. We are not equipped in solving this problem. <laughs> the people are the problem. The people are always the problem. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you. I guess that's the end of this uh, session. And uh, we must thank all the speakers, all the participants, and the, uh, the British Blockchain Association for putting together uh, this kind of uh, a forum. And uh, uh, we hope that, that next year it will be face to face because. We have a lot of things to discuss with all the speakers. And now we really, uh, this kind of format only delivers the talk, but it doesn't deliver the discussion uh, and opportunities to actually have a longer uh, you know, discourse on, on this topic. So I think it's very, uh, uh, we I look forward to having this uh, uh, somehow physical uh, meeting next time hopefully it will be done i got vaccinated today so all right so nasim oh thank you uh professor sandeep shukla uh nasim it, it seems that you are mute yeah okay right so that is the Nassim, are you ending the session? We cannot hear him. Unmute, Dr. Nassim. Yeah. But he's, show, he's showing his thumb, so I think it's... Yeah, somehow his voice is uh, gone. So so I guess, I guess uh, we, can, we can close, right? Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, we will meet in the lobby or lounge.
And thanks all of you. Thank you.